Most of the time, I run simulations to find ways to improve comfort for occupants. In this video, I switch focus to using simulation to help a consortium find ways to grow local protose in a region where vegetables tend not to be viable in open fields. They were at the far end of a very long supply chain, and they wanted to explore options. Their big idea was to construct a better than normal polytunnel so as to reduce heat losses and couple this with a subsurface heating scheme driven by waste heat from a local business. The consortium included a local landowner, a business who was currently dumping waste heat from a manufacturing process, a community group who wanted to upskill horticultural skills locally, and a builder who was willing to help tie the bits and pieces together. They found a horticultural expert who would recommend a selection of produce to grow, providing they could demonstrate the range of air and ground temperatures that their design might provide. This posed some very interesting questions. Could simulation deliver useful information to allow this group to have the confidence that their ideas would deliver a viable range of edible products? How are the matrix of design and operational options was quite large. And this was new territory for all of us. We really needed to reduce the size of the matrix. The approach taken was to delay investment in detail. Simplicity in form, composition, and numerical processes in order to first get an understanding of how the beastie was working and then build on that by intentionally increasing resolution. We wanted a model that was fit for purpose, neither overly complex nor overly abstracted. For the avoidance of doubt, simulation folks tend not to be horticultural boffins, and horticultural folks tend not to know much of anything about simulation might deliver. What we could agree on was that weather patterns were key to confirming a viable design. Here's the annual ambient temperatures typical of the region. Yep, it doesn't often get horribly cold. And it really isn't a joke to say that summer happened last Thursday. Spring lasts a very long time. If we look at sunlight, those brown lines are diffuse radiation and the blue lines direct radiation. Sunny days happen, but partly cloudy is the norm. And it is windy. And more often than not, we're talking about force six to eight. And if you don't know about the Beaufort scale, go and look it up. At more than 60 degrees north, summer days are long. Here's a quick animation looking at the polytunnel from the viewpoint of the sun. The morning and evening sun spends an awful lot of time in the northern quadrants. And in the winter, well, sunlight, not so much, and not much above the horizon. So here's the model. We started with an oval end polygon and extruded the zone sideways from it, and then added the framing and the openings. This is a minor twist on the usual extrusion of walls from a floor plan. There are three thermal zones along the length of the polytunnel so that some of the growing area is near the access door, some in the center, and one mostly sheltered. Of course, one can dig a very deep computational pit by jumping into 3D conduction and CFD for airflow patterns. Instead, we drew on the idea of a thin zone to represent the heater. We typically use this to represent floor heating systems within buildings. Essentially, a heater zone is a geometrically thin zone that extends to the edge of the polytunnel in plan, and it's placed below the polytunnel. Between the heater and the polytunnel are construction layers representing the growing medium. And Below the heater zone 
is about a one meter of earth. We inject heat into the stone, uses the same dynamic process used to solve heat transfer between rooms and with the outside. So we get the dynamics. And the initial feasibility, well, we wanted to use simple logic. Heat would be injected if the air temperature in the core of the polytunnel was, say, something about 12 degrees. In order to test sensitivity to the temperature of the working fluid and the overall capacity, the controller in the model was able to limit the temperatures within the heater zone, as well as the available capacity given to the heater zone. In order to test sensitivity to disruption in the supply, there are alternate controls which introduce some supply glitches. Air movement is another key aspect of horticultural, especially in a windy site, excess ventilation could remove valuable heat from the growing zone. Overheating risk is something that needed to be explored. As mentioned earlier, the project needed a simulation model that was fit for purpose. CFD would have been an overkill at this stage. But by the same token, imposing some arbitrary infiltration rate would introduce a lot of risk of oversimplification. So we used an airflow network. It allowed an interim level of resolution. We could track flows between the polytunnel zones as well as leakage with the outside, and it would require a minimum computational burden. Here's an image of the airflow network that was created. It includes boundary nodes around the facade as well as in each of the thermal zones. The leakage path between these nodes takes the form of various flow components, cracks, orifices, and some bidirectional flow representation of doors. Of course, to help moderate temperatures, the access door and the vent at the back of the polytunnel need to be controlled. A simple regime was applied. If it's cool inside the polytunnel, the doors and the vents are minimally open. If the temperature rises above something like 20 degrees, the doors and vents begin to open until fully open if the temperature is above something like 24 degrees C. So, does it work? Here's a graph of conditions during the January to early March assessment. The dark blue, green, and yellow lines are for the polytunnel zones. They drift above and below about 10 degrees C during the assessment. With 40 degrees C as the temperature limit in the heater, the heating is usually on with brief off periods when the polytunnel set point has been reached. It seems like conditions inside rise on sunny days, and there are instances where the polytunnel temperatures drop to, oh, something like 5 degrees. Probably high winds, low ambient temperatures, and brief door openings seem to be associated with these temperature drops. Focusing on the center portion of the polytunnel, the upper brown to red line is the upper surface of the growing medium. It tends toward about 19 degrees, except for sunny days. The skin of the polytunnel, shown in the red-yellow line, is several degrees cooler than the growing surface. The two red lines are the dry bulb and the resultant temperatures. Lastly, let's have a look at the distribution of temperatures through the growing medium over the period of the assessment. On the left, the black lines kind of range between 33 to 40 degrees C as the heating is applied or not. And on the right, the temperature at the growing top of the growing surface ranges between 14 to 25 degrees. This is the kind of information that the horticultural expert was looking for. So as we pass this information to the consortium and their advisors, each one could judge performance based on their specific areas of concern and the expertise they had. For example, if the temperature close to the piping would damage roots, then a model variant could be easily made with a different layering of growing medium or simply a greater depth of growing medium. Take a moment to rerun the assessment and pass the information back. So it could be an iterative process.